Welcome back, Time Crunched fans. I'm your host, Coach Adam Pulford. Uh, if you're new to joining us, welcome. The Time Crunched Cyclist Podcast is designed to give you all the actionable training advice in a shorter, condensed format. Also, we have a Q&A sort of format that we offer to all of our audience listeners, and that's what you're getting to be a part of today. Uh, if that sparks your interest, you can go over to trainright.com backslash podcast, click on ask a training question, and those questions get submitted over to me. I work on those and answer them in between our um bigger topic and subject podcast episodes. So today is going to be, it's, it's going to be a little rapid fire. We've got, uh, uh, so many questions pouring in that, um, I'm just going to do my best to, uh, get those answers out and, um, doing it in a pretty condensed format, straight into the point using both, um, applicable science that I've been using my own coaching practice for quite some time. And, um, that application of, uh, years and years of coaching. So let's get into it. All right. Question number one is coming from Christopher and here is, it's actually a series of questions. So I'll read them and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get, we'll get into the answers. Here it is. I currently struggle with recovery, flexibility, and time for long rides for sleep. I wake up consistently and have night sweats and snore. Would a CPAP machine be beneficial even if I didn't have sleep apnea? How much stretching should I do to increase flexibility? I want a new bike, but uh, my sacrum has no forward bend because how tight I am and it tends to be uh, causing pain in the lower back. And lastly, for a four-hour ride, could I get the same effect if I split two sessions in half, do one in the morning and one in the evening? So there's a lot there, Christopher, to unpack. So let's, let's take it kind of one at a time. Sleep apnea uh, or sleep disturbance. My advice is honestly to do a sleep study at a hospital to diagnose that. Um, if it is sleep apnea or what else could be going on, um, I'm not a doctor by any means, but I've had a couple athletes do this recently and it provided quite a bit of value in terms of insight into, um, how they sleep and, uh, some actual stuff to move forward, to get better sleep. Now, if you can improve your sleep, everything improves your quality of life, your mood, your energy, your training sessions, your adaptability. So this is definitely something to explore and definitely something to conquer, uh, in your journey as an athlete. Now I'm, I'm a huge fan of doing things, uh, naturally, uh, meaning without a machine or a pill or something like that. So it, go do a sleep study. If you're really that curious, this could help. Um, but also, you know, keep it simple first, make sure that you're setting the environment or setting the stage for really good sleep. And how that looks is you want temperature control. So you want to cool dark room in that cool temperature. I mean, really under 65 degrees is probably best. Um, there's some other stuff that you can do in terms of, you know, sheets and all this kind of stuff, but like from a very, uh, without spending a ton of money, just turn down the thermostat, <laughs> turn up the air conditioner, turn on a fan, that kind of thing. You also want a dark room. So as long as there's no ambient, um, light coming in, you know, shades drawn, all this kind of stuff. If you have blue lights and all these other lights from devices, unplug them, get rid of them, keep it dark. Also make sure there's little to no sound going on. So however you can control that sound in the room or even earplugs. Sometimes if you live in a very urban environment where there's just stuff going on all the time, minimize the sound. And if you can, if, if you're already doing all of that, then I'd go to that sleep study and, and, and perhaps uh, learn a bit more. If you don't want to do the sleep study, perhaps you get a device that can help you learn more or create more awareness about your sleep health or a ring is a really, um, good option for that. I know there's other things like the whoop devices and, and garments and whatnot. I tend to find in my coaching practice with myself as well as athletes that, uh, or a ring is, is, if, is a pretty good option for that. So soft plug for that, but I'll stay brand neutral and say there's, there's definitely other options out there that uh, my athletes use and find good success too. 
Next, for flexibility, your, your question on flexibility, especially in that um, in the hip region, your sacrum area, I'll encourage you to think more about this as quality movement through a range of motion. It's not just flexibility, okay? So it's not just stretching, although there's some stretching components that will need to occur. Think movement. So you want to train movement. You don't want to necessarily stretch a muscle or a tendon or something like that. My best advice on this is to go check out my two episodes with Aaron Carson, uh, who's an NSCA CSCS strength, uh, certified strength and conditioning specialist from the national strength and conditioning association. Uh, it's a mouthful, but she's awesome. Uh, go to ecfit.com, check out what she has there. And she's got a huge video library built out with movement specific training for endurance athletes. If you go on there, use trainright.com. You can get the first month free for access to her video library. And again, just search Aaron Carson Trainright podcast and you'll see, um, that was the name of this podcast before. Uh, and you'll see other episodes that I did with her, but, uh, what she's doing in Boulder for endurance athletes is an awesome starting point. If you're a self-coached athlete and you're looking for, um, advice in the range of motion, flexibility, uh, area. So Christopher, I'd, I'd send you there now two days. Yeah. Always a fun question to answer. And you know what? It, yeah. To, to your question, can you split two sessions up? Let's say it's a four hour ride and you split a session and get two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening. Yeah, totally. Um, and, and that, what that does is it gets more training in and that's first and foremost, if you're trying to increase fitness and kind of move beyond, um, where you're at right now, it won't be the same effect, mind you, as doing a, a pure four hour ride. Cause we've talked about this in, in other episodes. There's, there's different things that happen late in the game from a fatigue standpoint where, doing one continuous session has applicability. However, if you need more training effect, two days are a great way to do that. And if it's just pure endurance, yeah, yeah. I mean, nothing like more specific needs to be said, bang out two in the morning, two in the evening. Um, if you have some intensity, um, in that day or some performance goals, I put it in the morning when you are more fresh, fresh and, and, um, kind of more, have more energy and more energy on board. And so hit your intensity early, do your endurance late. That's the way I would, t uh, typically shape it up for my athletes. But really Christopher, get that sleep under control first. And you know, then the two days as well as everything else is going to go way better. All right. Question. So the second question, um, here we go. Hello, Adam. I'm an ultra runner and frequently listen to the time crunch cyclist podcast. Oh, great. That's awesome. Uh, I'm time crunch as well. And recently found your episode about training density example efforts on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday during high intensity blocks, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, um, and weekend during lower blocks of intensity. Could I apply the same pattern to running as well? Or would there be a reason to just stack everything each week rather than low intensity example mentioned above? Hope this makes sense. Thanks so much again. Awesome advice on the podcast. Makes my drive to work more enjoyable, Mark. Uh, cool. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, I'm glad you're finding uh, some of this here on the podcast to be applicable and useful. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it makes sense, Mark, uh, for all of our audience listeners right now, we're talking about training density and I did a whole episode on this and it's episode number 135. If you haven't listened to that, definitely check it out. Training density is, it, it's a term that we use, um, in, in the coaching world, um, to describe deepening training sessions for added effect. Okay. And it's really what that means is we're doubling down on, on one day going either longer or harder to put more training stress in a day rather than spreading it out over multiple days. So the, the kind of the common adage is, you know, if you have six to eight hours a week and you just keep on patterning it as 60 minutes or 90 minutes a day, can you get creative and take some time away from one of those days and add it to another. So then we increase the total duration 
of one day. And that's the most simple approach, most simple explanation. So if you if you do three hours on one day, say a weekend day versus 90 minutes and 90 minutes, you're increasing the training density of that day that you do the training for three hours versus 90 minutes and 90 minutes. And kind of what we were talking about in the previous question, there's a lot of benefit that can occur from going longer and densifying a training session. We'll get into that here in a second. But yeah, you can apply these that those same training principles, Mark, um, to running. That's that's actually your your question. In fact, uh, Coach Jason Coop wrote a great article about this, so I'm going to link to that in the show notes, so everybody, including yourself, can read um, more about that. And and he gives some really good examples of how to use training density um, in your week to week training. Now, for our listeners who haven't caught the episode. Or, or who are not familiar with training density, um, I, I think the most applicable thing here goes back to the the patterning, right? If you do, if you've been doing training consistently, say five days a week, and kind of that sixty to ninety minute example, like I was talking about, you've built up really good fitness, right? A really good base, and you're probably able to hold up and perform really well for, you know, hard threshold sessions of 40 to 60 minutes or group rides that have like really pointy efforts, <laughs> you know, for that duration in there, or maybe, you know, group rides that go up to two or two and a half hours, right? Cause you're used to doing that training. But some of you probably have a 70 or a hundred mile gravel race coming up soon and you're likely staring down <laughs> at a five to seven hour uh, tr uh, finish time on these things. And you're like, oh, when was the last time I did a five hour training ride? Right. And so at some point, you know, common sense should kick in and say, I need to change something to have a, either more fun or a good outcome at a hundred mile gravel race. So you likely just need to go longer, but how am I going to do that? And if you don't have that time, you can't do a seven hour ride, right? And I don't advise that, especially if you're time crunched, but go back to what I was talking about before. If you have three hours on the weekend, instead of doing one and a half, one and a half, go three. Because again, in episode number 135, when we're talking about training density, we talk about the specifics of what changes when you go longer. In particular, fatigue is not linear. Okay. So what happens in, you know, the, the hour three and four of a four hour ride is very different from the hour one to two. If you're not used to that sort of training stimulus, you get more tired as you get more depleted. And that's really the concept here that we're talking about. My podcast I did with Dr. Steven Seiler, we talk about durability and how increasing training density for many athletes will help you become more durable over time. So that's both for the long haul as well as hard repeated efforts. And this is where his polarized training model does a great job of organizing training to keep hard days, hard, easy days, easy, thus increasing training density, right? To provide more training stimulus on a given day. And this improves your fitness and performance. I'd say specifically to events, but also just in general, as you're, um, building your fitness and performance on this journey. So be sure to go back and check out those episodes, uh, Mark, um, that'll help do a, a really good job of kind of shoring up a little bit more of training density, but yeah, you can absolutely apply it to running and be sure to read that article from Coop. And that's going to be really, uh, really helpful. Okay. So in final summary, uh, you know, going back to Christopher, you know, sleep and consistent exercise are really important aspects, uh, to your, your questions first dial in the sleep, start there. So whether that means, you know, adding a wearable or, or, um, you know, going, doing a sleep study, that's pretty, you know, invasive and, and I would say very valuable, but really start with the controllables that are super easy. Just make sure that the room is dark. Make sure that the room is cooler, uh, set the stage for really good sleep. Make sure there's not a ton of noise going on. So if you do that, everything improves, <laughs> including those two days. Right. And then secondly, uh, for Mark, yeah, increasing training density is a great way for a time crunched 
athlete to deepen fitness on limited time. I'll reference uh, to Coop's article, like I talked about, Dr. Steven, Dr. Steven Seiler's episode that I did with him, as well as episode number 135 of Time Crunch Cyclist. And all of that will give our listeners everything they need to know about training density. So with that said, thank you all for tuning in to today's episode. Uh, we'll, we'll have more topics covered and more questions answered in the weeks ahead. I hope you got some good learnings from today's show. And, you know, as always, if, if you like what you hear today, please just share it with a friend. You can also rate and review us wherever you listen to your podcast. And that that's the most applicable and, and effective way that you can help grow the podcast. And it helps uh, for you you to keep on getting more actionable training advice to apply to your own training. Thanks again. Now get out there and train right.